Hello, this is Dr. Gandhi. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Abraham Shakespeare? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll start with the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Abraham Shakespeare was born in Lakeland, Florida on April 24, 1966. Not much is known about his early years, but evidently he did have some difficulties with the criminal justice system. As an adult, he worked as a truck driver's assistant. On November 15, 2006, Abraham and a co-worker of his named Michael Ford were in a truck driving toward Miami when they stopped at a convenience store in the town of Frostproof. Their intent was to purchase cigarettes and drinks. Michael Ford stepped out of the truck and asked Abraham if he wanted a soda. Abraham said that he wanted Florida lotto tickets instead. Abraham handed Ford $2 to pay for the tickets. One of those lottery tickets was worth $31 million. Abraham elected to receive $17 million as a lump sum instead of being paid more money over time. After taxes, he collected about $12.7 million. Michael Ford asserted that he deserved a share of the winnings and demanded Abraham pay him no less than $1 million. Michael Ford filed a lawsuit against Abraham after Abraham refused to pay. In court, Michael tried to make it seem as though Abraham had stolen the lottery tickets from his wallet. Abraham defeated Michael in court in October of 2007. The jury didn't buy Michael Ford's story. Abraham moved into a $1 million house in a gated community in North Lakeland. He made a number of other purchases, like he bought a $100,000 BMW, a Ford 500, and a Rolex. Abraham found himself being harassed frequently by friends and strangers who were very interested in his money. He was growing tired of this attention. He once told his brother that he was better off without the money. Abraham told a friend of his that he thought all those people were his friends, but then he realized they just wanted his money. I can picture this friend saying, Abraham, that's awful. What a tough story. Hey, by the way, speaking of your money, I'm running a little short. Abraham was not good at managing his money. By October of 2008, he had only about $3 million left in assets. About a million and a half was in cash. Around the same time, a woman named Dee Dee Moore arranged to meet with Abraham under the guise of writing a book about him. I'm not sure what was supposed to be in the book. As far as I can tell, the only thing that Abraham did that was notable was buying a lottery ticket. I guess it was going to be a short book. Dee Dee had never written a book before and had no experience with publication. She did have experience, however, in other areas. In 2001, she was convicted of insurance fraud and falsely reporting a crime. She was sentenced to one year of probation. In 2002, she filed for bankruptcy. In January of 2009, just a few months after Dee Dee met Abraham, Abraham's residence and other properties were sold or assigned to a company owned by Dee Dee Moore. In February of 2009, Dee Dee purchased a 2000 Chevrolet Corvette for her boyfriend. It cost over $70,000. In March of 2009, she bought a 2009 Hummer for about $90,000. In April of 2009, Abraham is seen for the final time in the Lakeland area. This same month, Dee Dee had virtually taken complete control of all of Abraham's assets. Right after this, Dee Dee called her ex-husband James Moore and asked him to dig a hole in her yard. She said she needed to bury trash and concrete. James came over and dug the hole. He returned two hours later to fill it in, he would later say it was too dark to see what was in it. In August of 2009, Abraham's cousin delivered a birthday card to Abraham's mother. His mother said the signature on the card looked like it belonged to Abraham, but the cousin did not say who gave him the card. Abraham Shakespeare's family reported him missing on November 9, 2009, just six days short of three years after he bought the ticket. They told the authorities that Abraham had not been seen since April of 2009, they thought that perhaps he had just taken his cash and run off to live on some beach in the Caribbean, but they were concerned something less pleasant had occurred. 
The police questioned Dee Dee Moore on November 12, 2009. They were trying to figure out how Dee Dee came to control Abraham's assets. She said that she paid Abraham in cash for everything. So essentially, she was saying that she had all these assets because she paid him for them. On December 3, 2009, during another interview with the police, Dee Dee said that the reason some of Abraham's assets went into her business account was to help him avoid paying child support. So here we see another story. On another occasion, she said that she never paid him because he would use the money to buy drugs. So once again, she's changing her story. Later that same month, Dee Dee writes a letter to Abraham's mother as if it was written by Abraham declaring that he is fine. The mother is surprised because Abraham was illiterate. On another occasion, Dee Dee was out to lunch with Abraham's mother when Abraham's mother received a call from someone pretending to be Abraham. On December 28, 2009, a man who Dee Dee paid to impersonate Abraham started cooperating with the police. The man introduced Dee Dee to an undercover police officer on January 21, 2010. Dee Dee agreed to pay the officer $50,000 if he would take responsibility for Abraham's death. The story of the undercover officer was that he was already facing a lot of time in prison, so pleading guilty to murder was no big deal. They could just tack that onto his sentence because it wouldn't matter anyway. The police officer told Dee Dee that he would be happy to take responsibility, but the police will not believe his confession unless he can tell them where the body is. Dee Dee would eventually end up telling the individual who went to the police in the first place where the body was buried, and she gave him a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver that was used to commit the murder. On January 28, 2010, the police would find Abraham's body nine feet in the dirt under a concrete slab at a residence in Plant City, Florida. It was clear the concrete had only been poured a few months earlier. The police believed that Abraham was killed on April 6 or April 7, 2009. Dee Dee would be arrested on February 2, 2012, and charged with murder 17 days later. In December of 2012, she was convicted of first-degree murder and possessing a gun in the course of a violent felony. She received life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder and 25 years for the gun charge. Now moving to my analysis. Was Dee Dee Moore actually guilty? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory factors. Prior to the police locating Abraham's body, Dee Dee had a number of different explanations as to what happened to Abraham, like where he was. She told people he had gone to places like Orlando, Puerto Rico, Texas, and Jamaica. She told some people he was being treated in a hospital. Dee Dee explained that Abraham was tired of all these people demanding money from him. Therefore, she assisted him in getting out of the area. After Abraham was dead, Dee Dee impersonated Abraham by using his cell phone to send text messages to his friends and relatives. The people receiving the messages noted that they didn't seem to be consistent with his writing style. Again, Abraham was illiterate. They tried replying to various text messages with questions they thought Dee Dee would not know the answer to. They did not receive a response. Dee Dee appeared to make attempts to escape responsibility. She offered to pay an acquaintance of hers to dig up the body and move it to a different location. She tried to find someone to take the blame for Abraham's death in exchange for $50,000. That someone, of course, was an undercover police officer. Dee Dee attempted to negotiate with the mother of one of Abraham's sons, offering to give her a house worth $200,000 if she would tell the police she had seen Abraham recently. Dee Dee gave $5,000 to one of Abraham's relatives to deliver a birthday card to his mother while implying it was from Abraham. Abraham's body was found buried in the backyard of a house that Dee Dee had put in her boyfriend's name. Dee Dee is the one who supplied the location of the body and the murder weapon. Dee Dee told the police a number of stories about how Abraham ended up dead. She blamed a lawyer, drug dealers, and her 14-year-old son. Later, she changed her story again, saying that she killed Abraham, but it was in self-defense. She admitted that she shot him twice in the chest. She was the one who caused his death. There were various financial transactions that Dee Dee could not explain. For example, she said she bought Abraham's house for $655,000 and 
and paid off almost $200,000 in outstanding loans. The police could find no evidence that Dee Dee ever paid anything to Abraham. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. There are no eyewitnesses to the murder and no video, so in theory it could have been self-defense. That's pretty much it for exculpatory evidence. This case is a little easier than most that I look at in that regard. Do I think that Dee Dee was actually guilty? Yes, I think she was guilty in reality and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's one of the clearest cases of guilt I've seen in a while. I guess it just proves that some people will still try to profess their innocence, even though there's essentially a zero chance that anyone would ever believe them. This story highlights the dangers of being a lottery winner, not just the homicidal risk, but the financial problems. Before meeting Dee Dee, Abraham was burning through money at an astounding rate. Many people have proposed the idea that winning the lottery is actually an extremely bad outcome for most people. This is referred to as the lottery curse. But is this actually true? Do most people who win the lottery end up losing it all, or otherwise having bad fortune? Years ago, there was a statistic falsely attributed to the National Endowment for Financial Education that said that 70% of lottery winners lose all their money in a few years. The group said that the statistic was not backed up by any research. We also see many anecdotes about lottery winners that had bad results, which are quite compelling. Obviously, most people would consider being murdered a bad outcome, like what happened to Abraham Shakespeare, but this is still relatively rare. More common are stories about losing money. It doesn't take too many anecdotes about a person who wins and loses five or ten million dollars to make an impression. The stories are certainly intriguing, but are they representative of a wider population? What does the research literature tell us about the fate of people who win a lottery? For the most part, lottery winners are able to retain their winnings over the course of many years. Most do not quit work, although they do tend to work less in the form of taking longer vacations. Constructs like happiness and mental health were measured for lottery winners. They did not change significantly. Considering the concern about the lottery curse, this is actually good news. They did not become less happy or have more mental health problems. Overall, life satisfaction improved for lottery winners. Even though the lottery curse probably isn't widespread, there are some problems that come about for lottery winners. One of the most significant is what happened to Abraham Shakespeare before he was murdered. All kinds of friends came out of nowhere demanding money. Suddenly, everybody was paying attention, trying to win their own lottery of sorts. They try to find a way to separate the lottery winner from their cash. Any person who comes into a lot of money quickly needs to not only be good at financial management, but good at managing relationships. They need to be good at figuring out who is genuine and who is fake. They need the ability to detect narcissistic characteristics. Is playing the lottery a good idea? In my opinion, no. Outside of some of the negative aspects in the unlikely event of a win, there is a statistical argument regarding the probability of winning that is notable. The chances of winning the lottery are very remote. Just like any gambling, the house is always going to win. Playing the lottery is actually worse than gambling in the sense that the money is lost more quickly. Depending on the type of casino and the game being played, every dollar gambled can expect to win about 90 cents in return. With the lottery, it's closer to 50 to 70 cents for every dollar played, again depending on the game. Some have referred to the lottery as a tax on people who are bad at math, or alternatively, a tax break for people who are good at math. The reality is that the lottery targets people in lower income brackets and overall has a devastating effect on them. Revenue from the lottery is often used for good purposes, like funding schools, so someone can make an argument that when they buy a lottery ticket, they are simply in agreement with those funding policies. Yet you don't see too many people volunteering to pay more income tax, real estate tax, or sales tax. Considering that schools need to be funded one way or the other, one could argue that the lottery is a tax for those who choose to play the lottery. They pay that tax, therefore other people do not have to. I have heard arguments for the lottery. One essentially says that it's a small amount of money to risk for a chance to win something 
that the person playing would likely never be able to earn. Overall, I think the lottery is a bad idea. It's an expenditure that has a very low chance of producing any financial benefit. A much better tactic is to take that money that would be spent on lottery tickets and invest it or save it. Final thoughts on the case of Abraham Shakespeare. I think this case reminds us that there are many people out there who are really just opportunistic. They look at lottery winners as a potential payoff for themselves. It's about greed and being inauthentic. It is important to be on guard against people who have narcissistic characteristics like being self-centered, regardless of whether somebody won the lottery or not. There are many people out there who are really just looking out for themselves. And unfortunately, in some cases, that is taken to an extreme. Like in the case of Abraham Shakespeare, he was eventually murdered due to greed and self-centeredness. The world is full of dangerous people, and money often attracts them. Those are my thoughts on the case of Abraham Shakespeare. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic better than winning the lottery. Thanks for watching.